Good evening, everyone. My name is Josh Owen. I am the Massimo and Lella Vignelli Distinguished Professor of Design and the Director of the Vignelli Center for Design Studies. I'm delighted to welcome you to the second lecture of this year's Vignelli Design Conversation Series presented by Design Milk and made possible in part by the generosity of RIT alumnus Chris Bailey and Bailey Brand Consulting. Rochester Institute of Technology's Vignelli Center for Design Studies is an international hub for education, research, collaboration, and advocacy, which expands the scope of the programs in the College of Art and Design School of Design. The facility houses the archive of renowned designers Lella and Massimo Vignelli, whose works are icons of international design. The center and archives sit within RIT's College of Art and Design, which was built on the traditional territory of the Onondaga or people of the Great Hill. In English, they're known as Seneca people, the keepers of the Western door. They are one of the six sovereign nations that make up the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. We honor the land on which RIT was built and recognize the unique relationship that the indigenous stewards have with this land. That relationship is the core of their traditions, cultures, and histories. We recognize the history of genocide, colonization, and assimilation of indigenous people that took place on this land. Mindful of these histories, we work towards understanding, acknowledging, and reconciling. As stewards of history and content, we must acknowledge and seek to learn from our context, bad and good, ugly and beautiful. This applies to the Vignelli Center as with any archive. The Vignellis taught us that design is a systematic framework for solving the world's most intractable problems. If 2020 has taught us anything, it's that while we as humans are adaptable, our societies and systems have major flaws. We're at a point when we need to have difficult discussions and work to create a new balance in the world. In this, design must play a critical role. As the new director, I aim to make the Vignelli Center even more accessible and applicable by bringing in exciting guest contributors from diverse and underrepresented backgrounds who are using design in innovative ways. The Vignelli's design is one philosophy leaves us with a universal message that design is a lens through which we can envision a more inclusive tomorrow. Before introducing our second guest of this year's lecture series, I'd like to take a few moments to set the stage. Out of respect for our presenter, participants will be muted for the duration of the event. But we do encourage you to enter questions you have for our presenter using the Q&A feature, and we'll try to get as many of them as possible during our closing Q&A segment. To begin, I'd like to share with you how honored I am to welcome my esteemed colleague this evening. Noel and I used to bump into one another in Philadelphia from time to time, and I'm thrilled to see him again, however virtually, here in Rochester tonight. Noel Mayo's full biography is far too long to read by way of an introduction. However, I'll do my best to hit the highlights of his storied and impactful career. Mayo is the owner and the president of Noel Mayo Associates Incorporated, the first African-American industrial design firm in the United States. He has been instrumental in establishing minority mentoring programs within the Industrial Design Society of America, the Society for Environmental Graphic Design, and the Ohio State University where he retired from a long and rich career in teaching in 2018. He has been a juror for the National Endowment for the Arts Panel, the New Jersey Council for the Arts, and the IDSA Annual Design Awards. He served as the president of the Philadelphia Economic Council, as well as the Greater Philadelphia Community Development Corporation. He's been a commissioner on the Philadelphia Art Commission and currently serves as an advisor to Metro Bank of Philadelphia. Mayo has designed telephones, seating, desks, lighting fixtures, offices, stores, and restaurants. His work has been on the, uh, his work, he has worked on the design exhibitions 
in Seattle, Chicago, Philadelphia, Lagos, Barcelona, Casablanca, and the 1964 New York World's Fair. Since the 1960s, Noel has enjoyed a special relationship with Lutron Electronics, designing a majority of their products and guiding their aesthetic and functional direction. Notably, he designed Nova, the first linear dimmer for commercial application. Remarkably, Noel is named in more than 1,205 patents and counting with Lutron alone. Please join me in a big virtual welcome for the legendary Noel Mayo. Very good. Welcome, Noel. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Well, let's uh, begin. We, we, we've done exhibits, products, graphics, and packaging and interiors. And this is a typical presentation that I would show a new potential client. So give samples in each of these categories of the work we've done over the years. <clears throat> Next, exhibits, which were mentioned earlier on. This is one I did in Casablanca, Morocco, prefabricated structure, printing presses running in the background, the one man helicopter. Um, when I got there, they were, the building was going up and they had poured one of the vertical columns on the right hand side of the image um, out of place. And they were trying to hammer it back with sledgehammers rather than re-pouring the foundation. And that was my greeting to the project when I got there. I was there two and a half months. It was completed on time, actually early. And uh, next, this is the real shot uh, of the piece. The torch burned with the, the president's message as people went in. Uh, in Arabic, and um, the grass you're looking at um, was planted early according to the specs, but the, the person who was responsible for planting it said, no, 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 don't do that. And the manager insisted, that's what it says in the specs, that's what we're doing. By the time the show opened, it was the height of wheat. We could literally watch it grow. Next. This is an exhibit we did for uh, the US Department of Agriculture. Uh, it was built in Spain and traveled throughout Europe, promoting US grains around the rest of, the, of Europe. Next. Uh, wheat and corn and barley, et cetera, there are samples inside uh, it was all designed in the, here in the States and then fabricated in Spain and traveled around Europe for about uh, six months or so. Next. The American Jewish Hist History Museum <clears throat> mobile exhibit was an exciting show that um, traveled throughout Jewish museums around the United States for about a year. It showed images of uh, famous developers and printers and fabricators, et cetera. Next, um, issues of, uh, one of my favorite stories is uh, Levi Strauss was out in California and people were coming there in their covered wagons and setting the whole thing on fire because they were sick of it. He, he bought all of the canvas from them for next to nothing and fabricated Levi's pants. And they were very, very durable because the material was quite tough to survive the trek of over a year to get to the West Coast. <clears throat> next. Product design is an exciting area. Uh, 
this was a product for Lutron. Uh, it was unique in its uh, function. All of the competition were simply gray boxes with no identification, maybe a logo on them. And we designed it so that uh, you would really notice it when you went in to check on anything in the electrical area. And that was their first uh, product that generally isn't seen by the public, but the architects and specifiers loved it and it worked better than the competition anyhow. Next. And their sales doubled. This is a product that I designed for a company in New Jersey. Uh, it turned out that all the ophthalmic exam centers being sold in the United States were made in Europe and uh, were quite expensive. And this little company in, in uh, New Jersey had a vision for entering that market. And I designed it, if you look at the right, as a place for the examiner to wash their hands, drawers for lenses and uh, samples, et cetera, frames. And we did the whole thing. And, and they said, I said, uh, how are you gonna sell it? And they said, we'll be taking it to a show in Chicago. And I said, what well, will be the objective of the having the exhibit there? And they said, we hope to sell enough to pay for the trip. And I said, that's all you expect? And they said, yes. We've never made money on these strips, but it get, does get the product introduced to the public. Well, I happen to have an IDSA conference going on at the same time. I went over to see how they were doing. I, I saw him at the end of the row and he saw me and ran away. And by the time I got there, he came back with a handful of checks he says, we sold over half a million dollars worth. I don't know how we're gonna make them, but uh, they did uh, successfully complete the products. Next. I didn't design this. Uh, it's a before shot of a, quite a complex telephone and, and uh, you had the dialing pads and you could have a series of out uh, calls preset uh, modules on the right that you could add more phone numbers and simply hit the button. And I said, uh, what do you want to do with it? And they said, well, we want it to look like it's uh, technically as good as uh, possible, but you can't touch the buttons. And I said, why not? And he said, well, each one costs a dollar and it has a light behind it, et cetera. And I said, well, I think we could save you some money there. Next. Um, we redesigned all of the buttons. Uh, they had LEDs behind them and uh, they, the whole strip cost a dollar. So you could type a message on a keyboard at the base to your secretary or anyone else. And then all of the dialing was in the center. You could speak into the microphone on the left, next, uh, and be heard. They also came out with a stock market uh, trader control center. Amazingly, um, they could dial out the two people at the same, close to the same time, listen to three people on the right, uh, turn up the volume, or whatever, and, and this was an, another instant success for the company. Next. The first uh, product for Lutron, uh, I, they wanted a slide dimmer. Uh, I sat and made sketches with the owner and he said, I want a, a slider that looks unique, et cetera and uh, we'll have a metal face plate on it. And these are marker sketches. And I, he said, I want you to, I like what you designed with the button. I want you to draw that up and we'll take care of the rest. 
And on the way back to the office, he said, when, before I left, he said, when, when do you think you'll have the drawing? And I said, I'll have it for you Monday. Uh, I'll work over the weekend. And on the way back, it was an hour and a half drive, I began to realize this wouldn't be appropriate in any job that I did. You know, the color had to, would have to change. And who would want to look at that slot? Next. It came on with a snap on faceplate. The slider was easy to grasp and there was no slot there. I called him up on Monday morning and, and he said, how are you doing? And I said, fine, but I don't have the button you asked for. I have a totally different idea that I made models of and uh, I think you'll be pleased. And he said, he was very upset and uh, I can't repeat what he actually said, but <clears throat> after some squabbling, I said, look, it's an hour and a half drive each way. I'll drive up, show it to you. If you don't like it, you don't have to pay me. I drove the hour and a half, I had the models and sketches, and this is what came out of that work. And he fell in love with it, and that was I didn't realize it at the time, but that was their second product. The first one he had done, which is a rotary dimmer. Uh, and this just went through the roof in terms of sales. Next. <clears throat> first tabletop dimmer. Um, the LED comes on when, you, when the lights are out, so you can find it in the dark and find a slider and uh, dim the lights to whatever level you wanted. It was a total success for the company. There was nothing out there competing with it. Next. <clears throat> this was a, a breakthrough product that um, if you see the four buttons on the right and the fifth one is a little bit lower, um, uh, that's what I wanted to do. The, the bottom one is power on. And the others, I set a series of preset light conditions that you could change by flipping the top cover up and readjusting the lights. So uh, during the meeting, they said, wait a minute, this that lower button is outside of the back box. Back box, which calls the high powered uh, electronics and switches. And I said, yes. And they said, we can't do that. We can't have it outside the back box. And I said, what about a low voltage switch that would turn on the power? And there was a couple of minutes of silence. And then I said, oh, God, okay, we'll, we'll do it. It became a bestseller throughout the Western Hemisphere. I've, they recently told me that uh, that one product carried Lutron for 20 years, which I thought was astounding. But every restaurant owner, office building person could control the lights without running around to different rooms, turning them up and, and down. So it was a terrific success for them. Next. Slide dimmer on off switch at the bottom, very simple, no screws, everything snapped together. Next. First, the remote control dimmer um, and switch on the left, you could raise the lights manually, on the right, you could control it from your desk and the executives loved it. If they had uh, any kind of requirement to lower the light level etc. The silver button is on and up down preset light levels if you wanted it. Next. First touch anywhere dimmer. This was a concept of the owner. Um, series of LEDs. So if you touched at the very top, it would be full bright anywhere in between would give you a, a level and then on off at the base. Very simple, very clean. Next. 
If you've uh, been to a hospital and have a, your blood taken uh, 30 years, years ago, um, you would have to wait up to two days to get the results back from the sample. And this company came up with a tabletop sampler that would print out the results of the content of the blood. Next. The, um, they put a cuvette of the sample in and it would give you a, the results within minutes. Did it all in black because the doctors, I realized they were dripping blood all over the place and, and it would be outside of a, um, a room on a floor. One to a floor was the idea. <clears throat> and they dripped it all over and it looked like the blazes. So we made it easier for them to clean it and not look at something that was upsetting to people wandering back and forth or working there. <clears throat> Next, I'm going to turn it on. The graphics and packaging, um, logo identity. Uh, many of these are clients, uh, furniture companies, the Spectrum Sports Arena in Philadelphia at the bottom. Um, all kinds of manufacturers that we did work for. And the top center is uh, Raymond Grinalls, who's a lighting consultant that we've worked together for years. Um, he's a brilliant uh, engineer, registered architect, and turned to lighting uh, because he realized it was not being handled well. <clears throat> Next. Uh, you saw the Bell furniture before, and these are detail shots that we did for their brochure cover. And uh, they've done quite well over the years. Next. You can guess uh, how many people think that's the same company. Uh, Epos was a product in the company, and Unipac was another product in the company, and the two divisions were fighting with each other. I was uh, intrigued by the fact that the, the uh, unit on the right had three different logos on the unit. And uh, the only thing they had in common was basic information started at the top and went to the bottom. And uh, the typefaces had nothing to do with each other. And then squeeze into the middle is EM Diagnostic Systems. Um, the owner, the president of the company um, found out about me and said, oh, we have this problem. Could you want to see if you could fix it? Uh, his son was in one of my students and had recommended that I talk to his father. So I asked him, he said, uh, what do you charge? And I told him and he said, well, I just want to critique uh, and some direction on how to fix it. Um, I went over, made a presentation. They had the entire boardroom table covered with their packages and materials, print materials that I asked them to do. After the presentation, he said, I want you to take on this product, solve it. And if you do a good job, I want you to redesign our offices. So that wound up being uh, a year's work. But in any event, uh, next. We tried to look like it, make it look like it was by one company. Um, so the same format in a sense, but more consistency. Uh, we went on to do promotional material that competed with DuPont and they were incredibly successful. Next. You have a choice and a chance, a chance to compete against the test your, their product against DuPont's product. And uh, when I went to see them, 
for another presentation. Everybody was pointing at me and I was saying, am I zipper open or what? And, and waving and things. And it turned out they had gotten a million dollars worth of orders in just a couple, less than a week, I guess it was. Uh, next, <clears throat> packaging for Lutron's uh, tabletop dimmer. Um, you can see it, see how it works. The cord was in the left-hand side and the right-hand side showed you how easy it was to set up. Next. Uh, a company that came to the United States selling these products just piled around on, on tables and I suggested that they should package it. And uh, they did. And we realized early on that people would tear open a package to check the color. And even though it might sell them a color, they weren't sure and more comfortable. So we made one side you could see the color and the other side we showed you how to use it and the top gave all the dimensions and volumes. Very successful for them. It's a European company that was entering the US market for the first time. Next. Work for DuPont, uh, they had a schedule of uh, going to a show in Chicago in two weeks. And someone decided that they needed to redesign all their packaging for this line of <clears throat> test chemicals. And uh, in talking to them, they said uh, many of the technicians can't give the name of the product. They foul it up. And uh, I suggested we just use numbers. You could have the real name below it, but if you need test number two or three or six, <clears throat> all you had to do was that and they could find it. And uh, we managed, we would meet with them in Delaware, drive down to Wilmington, go through a review, a review of sketches, make changes on the way back, work on it at the office. <coughs> and every two days we made a presentation. So they got to the show and the sales are terrific for them. Next. Um, this was a case where a company that made these kind of cooked hams, um, were being hammered by ham companies that were putting them in metal containers. <clears throat> and they wanted to fight back. Um, this is not my design. This is, I gave them the price. They said, well, we're, that's really too high. Uh, we're gonna go with uh, the people who did this pastry company packaging in New York. Um, so I said, fine. So they put out a million hams. They sold less than a hundred thousand. This was a box that was not waterproof. The ham was rolling around inside it. It would dent the box. The customer would put that one down and then pick up another one and take it. Um, they sold less than a hundred thousand out of a million they put out and the next thing I knew, they were back saying, we would like you to do it for us and we'll pay you whatever the fee was. Next. So what we did was made it uh, essentially a coated box. The ham was shrink wrapped into the box, locked in so you could see it squeeze it, see that it was juicy. We gave uh, a couple of recipes for what you could do with the ham and they sold out. Very, very, very successful. Next. And then finally we do interiors and signage and et cetera. Next. Uh, this is Lutron's first building. Uh, designed by others is just a prefab structure. And you can see the kind of narrow peaked roofs that were not just totally industrial. 
So I suggest they put the little band around it to hide some of the equipment, et cetera. Next. As, a, as they grew, they wanted an office building that looked like an office building. And I recommended a very good architect um, and uh, who is well known in the area. And the owner asked him to make a sketch <clears throat> of what he thought the building could do or just let's see how you draw kind of thing. And the architect said, no, that, I don't do that. My colleague here does that. And he went and made some sketches. And the owner said, no, I want you to design it. And I said, okay, <coughs> the architect will get it built. So I made sketches for plans and elevations. Next, and this was the first building I did for them. Uh, the arched area went straight from front to back. So all the peripheral windows uh, got nat light naturally, but the people in the center also got natural light. And they loved the building. This was the first office building, just two stories and a basement, lower level. Next. They went on to do a, what amounted to a four-story building with the same idea. Um, and everyone's very, very happy with it. Next, interior shot of the light coming in to all the areas. And uh, they use a center court for uh, announcements and things like that. People love going into it. Next. First liquor store I ever did. And the owner had put up all these little hand painted signs that uh, no one could read. And people were dropping bottles on the wonderful tile floor <clears throat> and breaking them. And he said, I don't, you know, I don't know what to do. And he gave me the contract to redesign it next. So they could find a scotch and bourbon and vodka and gin and rum and the beer was on the right and cases and carpet on the floor, which reduced uh, breakage dramatically. And the staff wasn't tied up trying to show people where the various um, types of liqueur were. <clears throat> very, very successful. Next. I've done furniture. Um, uh, on a royalty basis, which was wonderful. Uh, I got a report of sales and a check every, typically every month. Next, and so was for the same company. There's a company called David Edward out of Baltimore. And the owner had done his thesis on how to build a business using federal dollars. And he literally did it, he turned it into $100 million business in a couple of years. Next, <clears throat> uh, this is a chair I designed for another furniture company. Uh, the, the fabric was uh, a sample made for an interior I was working on. The, the wife loved this pattern, but they also love the chair. It's just very comfortable. Next, uh, you can see the chairs in the background. That dining table was $10,000. They had bought it already. Seats eight people, two on each side. Uh, I designed the lamp, light fixture. The shelving credenza and the glass wall on the left with a shelf on it. There was a door there that opened and they could serve directly from the kitchen without walking another. 20 feet to get to the dining area. And I designed the chairs in the foreground. The coffee tables are two triangular tables that you could split apart um, and use them separately or together.
X. We raise the floor two steps in the center of the space because the owner uh, was a distributor for Armstrong products. And he would invite people to the house and he wanted to break them up in groups so that he could talk to them individually. Uh, we designed the uh, coffee table in the center. <clears throat> the artwork was commissioned next. And the owner and his wife were collectors of Remington art and ceramics and things. So we created a place for them to present that at the front door. And down the, the, toward the back right uh, was a children's room. And it was quite a walk, it was about 40 feet and uh, 50 feet. And the children's room was there, but the experience of getting there was not pleasant. I created under a separate agreement, the artwork on the right, the yellow down to dark rust. Um, and those panels pivoted. So they would send me photographs every couple of months and as they changed it, they could be parallel, parallel or angled or the other side was blue. And so they could play all kinds of games to make the experience really fun. Next. I did a, the first black bank in Philadelphia. Um, and the, when I, before I made the presentation, they asked me how many banks I had done. I said, none. And they said, well, you know, the other two companies, all they do is banks. So, you know, why are we talking to you? And I said, but I, I, th I hope it's because you found out that I've been successful with uh, well, the projects I've done. And I said, uh, I've looked at the bank and I can assure you that uh, when I'm done, you will, your deposits will increase. And I said, how? And I said, because I will use color. Most people go into banks and they're very uncomfortable. <clears throat> if it's a crowd, they go get the pen and deposit slips and things and 10 people get it in front of them in line. And I will design something that will allow them to get in line, fill out the forms and get to the registered tellers more comfortably. And the color will make them put more money in because it will lower their blood pressure and anxiety. So I had pink in three levels in this vertical walls. <clears throat> and in the carpet. And to their amazement, their deposits were twice what they expected. It was an all black bank. And uh, it was very successful for quite a while. Next. Uh, entrance to a major corporate drug manufacturer uh, the waiting chair on the right, guard in the center, traffic going around them. 2,000 people went into the complex through this entrance and we changed it. Next. Traffic raised the seating. Uh, they could put runners down for snow. Got the confrontation out of the way. The contract between the main floor and the seated areas was deliberate. Uh, so you knew you had to step down and yet you weren't being trampled by all these people coming in. Very, very pleasant for guests. Yes. Uh, some graphics for Lutron. Uh, Located in the buildings next. Parking, graphics, etc. Next. Uh, this wasn't implemented until this year. The owner passed away. Uh, this has been two years now. Um, 
and he didn't implement the signs were sitting all designed for I guess it was 15 years or so because he didn't want signs up making them look like they were very prosperous. He liked the idea that people thought they were just a little company struggling along and he, he would get uh, people offering to buy the company from him because they thought they were tiny. Next. Or he loved the idea of, of teasing them. This is the gallery signage we did in the uh, <clears throat> long mall in, in uh, Philadelphia. Next, it was a four level mall, went down to the subway, <clears throat> four levels, uh, three levels above grade. Next. Robinson Luggers was a company that uh, had gone into the busiest corner in Philadelphia, Broad and Walnut. And um, my suggestion was that they didn't have enough space. And they said, well, we're just a little company. We'll just get us in there. Next. So we designed the store with the high counters for small leather items, et cetera, and low counters for luggage, et cetera. Their sales were double what they expected and they stayed there almost 20 years. And uh, a bigger company bought the space and they moved out and the owner retired actually. Next. The Spectrum in Philadelphia, the arena, we did the corporate identity. Next. Uh, this is an entrance uh, to the private club. <clears throat> the door on the left goes to the event, the door to the right of it goes to the restaurants. And uh, people just didn't know what to, what to do. Um, next. So we made the, when the game was about to start and the people had to line up, we used the lights to tell us time to go upstairs, added more storage space, made the restrooms uh, clearly identifiable. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, next. Uh, another shot of the projectors on the floor getting bumped by the guests, random pictures on the walls. Next. So we hung a projector and put in consistent full color pictures. Their sales uh, went through the roof and world, the number of customers who joined doubled. And we next, we, um, we went back and changed the color of the carpet to gray because the noise level went up, alcohol's consumption went up. Um, and we realized that it was too much red. And we wound up doing peripheral products for them. This was a, a retail store put in a mall to sell sports equipment, and memorabilia from the Spectrum. Next, <clears throat> Basco was a favorite store of mine. It, um, we wound up redoing their corporate identity. And then next, um, this was an information person at the front door, seated at a standard 28 inch or 30 inch high desk, uh, yellow and black, <clears throat> it works for Chinese, but uh, it doesn't work well for the American market. No one knew what she was there for. The sign, the arrow says fire extinguisher. So we went in and we actually did a prototype for them, a simple store down in Maryland. And the sales were unbelievable. And we got to do major stores. Next. You knew what she was there for, the, the artwork they were selling, the counter, she wasn't being talked down to. And we did the whole place in 
whites. Next, <clears throat> with a red carpet, uh, dark red carpet. The jewelry was in the back of the store originally. I put it 20 feet from the front doors. They were afraid they were gonna be robbed. Um, but the reality was people didn't know that they had very high quality jewelry for very good prices. So we made the jewelry island uh, at the front and you have to walk around it to get to the lost leaders in the back. Um, the points kept traffic out and when women dropped in the Vs, they weren't getting padded and things during the holiday. So it was very, very successful for them. We did four tours in, in uh, Pennsylvania and one in New Jersey. Next. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, you, you fill out a form, give it to the teleserve person, and they uh, go get it for you. Um, next. And then when your number was called, you were told to go to number three or four or whatever to pick up the product. Every store was doubled in sales. Next. And then uh, it's been quite a while now. Uh, we did the light fixtures with Raymond Grinald uh, for the Philadelphia Convention Center. These are indoors. Next. And outdoors. And some in, some on the outside as well of this particular model. Up down lights as, as well as light in the center. Next. One of my favorite little jobs is uh, graphics for a, a uh, black high school uh, in Philadelphia. Next, <coughs> banners outside, banners inside. Uh, I love peace, I love my school. Positive statements that the kids could see and remember and use. We were all around the building and some on small signs uh, just above head level and, and uh, very successful. It was one of the few times that I, I made the presentation at a board and got a standing ovation. Next, and well, that's it. Thank you very much. Hope we didn't go over time. And uh, if you have any questions, please please feel free. Thank there you. you. Uh, well, first, uh, just a note coming in from your your colleague and mine, Lorraine Justice, who says, uh, oh, wow. "Hi, you know." <laughs> Hi. <laughs> um, I know that you and Lorraine go back a long way uh, through Lutron and uh, and uh, OSU and yeah. You know, yeah. You. Um, I'm seeing a few questions come in now, so I'm going to um, read the first one here, which is uh, from a graduate student here in industrial design. She's asking. Uh, well, first she says good evening to you, Noel. Um, mm -hmm. Her question. Uh, is from all these amazing projects that you've shown us today, do you have a favorite? And thank you so much for this great lecture. Oh, thank you. Well, I have, uh, in each category, I have a favorite. You know, it's just been uh, fun. Mm -hmm. Lutron has been uh, the one where I've done the most in-depth work over the course of my career, watching the company grow from, you know, their first product to uh, where they are now, number one in the world. And no one's ever seen a television ad ever <laughs> on from Lutron. And uh, I had the pleasure of watching them being a part of the growth. And they've been very, very fair about it. it, it just no other company ever offered a patent. They would simply take it and give it to the head of engineering or whoever. And, uh, and that happens in lots of, of companies. <clears throat> so with Lutron, I had no idea that they were 
recording them all. And that uh, uh, I, I had a, a friend who's written two books. Well, he's just finished the third one on uh, blacks and patents. And his discovery was that most blacks who in the early days of the uh, development um, never got credit. They would change their names, et, et cetera. And uh, he found that he could tell by some of the names that which ones were African-American. In any event, he, he wound up calling me and telling me that um, you have 309 patents. And I said, I didn't know that. I had no idea. And uh, he said, yeah, it's amazing. You have more than anybody, any other designer in the country. And I said, that's amazing. I happened to mention it to Lutron and they said, no, that's, that's not correct. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I think it's more than that. So they got the head of the, the patent team who uh, came up with the over a thousand patents that I, I had been signing these darn things almost monthly, but uh, never really counting them. <laughs> and uh, when I first started, they would give Joel, the owner would give me a dollar, a brand new dollar bill and say, that's payment for the patent. Thank you very much. But uh, I lost count. And it turns out it's more than anyone in the United States and Europe combined. So very lucky, very honest company. Wonderful. Um, there are more questions coming in. Um, mm -hmm. This one from my esteemed colleague and current director of the industrial design program, Bruce Leonard. He says, uh, you mentioned a difficult and challenging client you had to work with. Can you talk about a challenging project that kept you up at night? <laughs> uh, somehow I've never been... I don't know what happened, but I never felt stressed about doing work. For you know, you go to a meeting and they describe what you what the problem is and ask you to solve it. And for some reason, I I just never felt anxiety about it, and that I never understood it myself. You know, I just <laughs> would say, okay, I can do this or that, and. This one's better than that one, and I'll show both, and we'll pick or whatever it turned out to be. And so I've never had, <clears throat> I guess the scariest client I ever had was a, a $2 million restaurant, reno restaurant renovation. And I would make four plans and show it to the client, and he would say, oh, okay, that's, that sounds good. And halfway through the project, it was the construction was coming along, and he he said, "This is really great." <laughs> I'm really pleasantly surprised, and I said, "Well, what do you mean?" And he said, "I said you've seen you know all the plans and elevations." He said, "I didn't know what the hell I was looking at. It. <laughs> I didn't understand it, <laughs> but I trusted you to get it right, and that's that scared me." to that. That was the only time I realized if that had not been something that really worked, it would be a lawsuit <laughs> or a potential one. And that led me to doing perspective drawings for every interior and, uh, and before computers and things. It's, it was a lot of fun. And I enjoyed it and it helped me make sure that both sides understood what they were looking at. Well, it speaks volumes that that client extended their trust in your abilities, regardless of uh, their- It was amazing, yeah. I mean, I, I had no idea <laughs> that he didn't know, have a clue what he was looking at. So from then on, I always uh, illustrated whatever I was talking about. Well, it's another illustration of, of your character because uh, you could easily have sort of just said, you know, thank goodness that he trusted me and, and walked away. And yet you took the opportunity to redesign your process, recognizing right. that there was a potential problem in communication. That's exactly. an admirable uh, way of, of tackling that. 
Um, a question from uh, a student, I believe, that's coming in. Uh, can you share a problem in your design process and how you solve it? Hmm. Well, I guess it, I mean, there, I see the problems as kind of opportunities that other people didn't see. The client didn't see, or other in the case of the ham in a box, uh, the client didn't see, the, the people who designed the box in New York didn't see. And uh, so I look for opportunities uh, for innovation. You know, it's like uh, the ham in a box and exposing the ham in a way that people could see it and squeeze it uh, and, and understand that it was uh, really baked and all they had to do was heat it. And that happened with Lutron. It, it, the, uh, the first slide dimmer button, uh, which the owner loved, um, I realized on the way home or back to the office at that point, <clears throat> wasn't right. I mean, it didn't make sense to have a sl slot if we could avoid it. And I played with it over the weekend and got a totally different concept. And somehow I've always done that. I mean, I, I do it when I'm teaching, uh, when I was teaching, I'm still teaching in a lot of ways, but um, it's very important. And I've always just assumed that uh, it happens with most designers, you know, that uh, when I was in school, uh, there was a paper company that I was a sophomore and this paper company came and said, we want to design a six pack carrier out of paper. The graphics on the outside is the key. <clears throat> and I said, uh, uh, hmm, that's interesting. Uh, and I, came up with the notion that the cans could be the solution with a handle. And when I presented it, the, <clears throat> the client went totally berserk. He said, this is ridiculous. We sell paper. That's what we care about. You have no paper. You're using less paper. And I said, well, I think that's the future. I mean, it's not going to be this forever. And uh, and luckily, the head of the department was there. And he said, well, we encouraged him to go with the idea, which, which he hadn't done. He just said, it's a great idea, you know. But uh, years later, you've seen it, <laughs> you know. And I look at uh, what's the water companies now wrap the whole set of cans and paper to keep them clean, you know, primarily. And, and uh and it's better advertising from their point of view, but they've painted the neck to carry. You know, they haven't solved that problem well. I hope that makes sense. It does. Um, there's a question here from one of my colleagues in uh, at RIT's uh, marketing and communications um, area. Uh, Kin is, is asking, um, well, she says, amazing legacy great body of work. What is your perception of the RIT design aesthetic and brand identity system? I don't know if that's putting you on the spot, if you've had a chance to take a look or not. No, I haven't. Unfortunately, I haven't. But uh, whenever I talk to any about, anyone about the presentation, uh, there's always some positive ideas that come out. It's a great school. They've done well and turned out good people, et cetera. So, I, I, you know, uh, between OSU and the University of Arts in Philadelphia, where I was chair for 12 years or something, um, I've always tried to take that information straight into the class, you know, as soon as I see something unique. And I'm sure every, every educator try, tries to do that. <clears throat> Sure. Um, okay, there's another one, uh, I think from a student. Uh, 
for the light remote controls were there graphics that showed the buttons functions and what influenced your decision to not include labels such as on and off? It was so simple. <laughs> Talk about a quick learn. Up is on, down is off, that's it. And the rockers, I mean, you could pick it up and it, it taught you, you know, it, there was no uh, need. And, and most of them were sold to high-end companies. The president of a company uh, wants it in his office or around the building, et cetera. And the, the simplicity was the key. I mean, people weren't uh, threatened by it at, um, at all. Some of them were complex products. When you lift that plain gate up on the wide one with a low voltage switch outside the box, um, there was all kinds of other controls and they had identifiers and levels and numbers saying how high up and that sort of thing. So it was, and, and the, the salespeople presented that in a way that made it clear to the users very quickly. So it's always been, uh, Lutron has been good at figuring that out as well. That's great. I think we have time for, for one more question here and uh, it's a good one perhaps to, to wrap with. This is coming from, uh, I think a student as well. Um, it says, hello, Noel, thank you for this great presentation. What do you think industrial designers, especially new ones, should know or keep in mind when starting a project and when dealing with a company? Hmm. To uh, try to be as innovative as, as you can. Uh, there are all kinds of technical people behind the products who know the ins and outs of how it really works and the limitations, et cetera. And uh, you have to absorb that information. If, if it's a new client that you haven't worked with in that technology before, you have to really learn to listen and, and ask questions and say, well, why did you do that? And how does that really work? And what's the benefit and that sort of thing. And um, quite often uh, it comes up with the uh, Lutron. They've got a whole new product. They've never seen it before. They've made eight or 10 or 20 models and things like that. And, uh, and I just start asking questions. Why'd you make this shape or that color or whatever it is? And we kind of back, into a new solution that they hadn't thought about. So being open um, is critical. And, and like the first product I did for Lutron, he wanted a slide button. He wanted a Lutron blue and the rest of white and a metal faceplate. And I realized that I wouldn't be able to talk him out of it, but I didn't think it would be as, uh, uh, a challenge initially to just describe it to him and then, and then show it to him. But he recognized the difference. He really realized that he hadn't thought about it that way. He, he did know that slotted things were, and you could have a little button on it and that would be it. But when he saw it and saw the sketches, it changed the whole paradigm for everyone. And he was smart enough always to listen. I mean, he, he listened in ways that no other client did. I mean, he really said, why, why do you do that? Why, is, should, why should it be so simple? And then he began to realize, damn, that's, it, that's the key. I mean, it's, it is simple. It, it's simple to use, it's quick learning curve, no problem. And it's beautiful on top of it. So they, their products sell around the world to primarily high-end customers. 
I'm always shocked that how many people don't know what a, a dimmer is. You know, they just, with a light switch, <laughs> that's good enough. And then if they discover the levels that you can control, it becomes a, a love affair. The wife usually recognizes it instantly that, wow, that would be great in a dining room or in a, you know, bedroom, whatever. And, uh, and they usually push the sale. If you go to Lowe's or Home Depot or whatever, you see their products and you can touch them, but they're all kind of middle of the road, uh, middle market products and, and uh, they sell nicely, but people kind of discover them there, there and they say, wow, I never saw this one. And their biggest competition is right next to them. <laughs> and uh, they still outsell them. So I hope that answered the question. Great answer. Well, yeah. no, I, I just want to thank you so much for uh, joining us here in the Vignelli Center. Uh, I have to share just a little antidote with you. I was thinking about the first time that I met you many years ago in Philadelphia. It was at a, an art opening or design opening, actually, in the, one of the first uh, iterations of Design Philadelphia, the civic event. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had known about your work. I had, you know, experienced it uh, in my own home, uh, clicking on light switches. Uh, I'd been to the convention center and, and, and bought something at Robinson's Luggage. Uh, oh. So I, I was aware uh, in a hands-on way of your work for, for many years. But uh, at that uh, event, when you, when you walked in, uh, and I think you walked in and you were just looking at the work, uh, the crowd audibly uh, got a little bit quieter. And I turned to a colleague and, and I said, is that Noel Mayo that just walked in? And they said, yeah, that's Noel Mayo. So I just wanted to share with you that, that you do have this kind of legendary uh, persona for those of us in the know. And for so many people who don't know the stories about the designers behind the things that they live with in a day to day uh, in day to day life, um, your your story shows incredible impact that that design brings. And so I just want to thank you for all that you've done to contribute uh, to our collective culture. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it too. Well. Take care and uh, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. Look out for our next lecture a month from now. We'll be sending out details soon. Take care everyone. I let me know too. I'd like to at least view, view more of them. If I possible. Thank you very much. Good night Take all. Care. Good night.